didn't leave us here to not come back. Amen. 405 as we get started our last night of revival. If you'll stand with me as we open up this service with 405, take my life and let it be consecrated. We'll sing uh, the first, the third, and that last. Take my life and let it be consecrated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Father, we do uh, come to you and we thank you that, uh, that you have redeemed us, you have purchased us, you've brought us into your family, given us an eternal home in heaven. There's so much that we have yet to even begin to enjoy as a believer that is still yet to come because of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray tonight as we finish our revival meeting that this would not be the end of a revived heart, but that it would be the beginning of a renewed walk with you and renewed strength in your spirit. And we ask that you be with Brother Willette tonight as he brings the final message of this meeting. Lord, may it be exactly and only what you would have for us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. And we are, again, certainly glad you are here. And just a reminder, uh, the offering box in the back there, if you would like to give tonight uh, everything that comes in tonight, unless it's marked ties or it's marked missions or something, We'll go to Brother Willette's love offering, and um, he's leaving whether we give or not. It's not one of them circumstances where we, we want to give to get him out of town. It's, he's going either way. Uh, he came prepared for that eventuality. And, uh, so, uh, but if you uh, plan on giving, um, please do that. Brother Steve's going to grab the offering out of there tonight, right, uh, right at the end, towards the end of the service. So don't delay on that. If you're planning to give, if you're giving online, please take care of that right now because shortly after the service, we're going to pull down all the online numbers and uh, put those together so that we can give him uh, what has been given. So, all right, with those announcements out of the way, I hope, well, it is Wednesday night, right? Mm -hmm. Some of you are not sure. Uh, how many of you went home Monday night? confused as to what day it was because you just came home from church on a Monday night? Okay, I did. Uh, you know, my, my body clock works on Sundays and Wednesdays. It gets reset by being in church. And if church is on a different night or we, for some reason we didn't have church, the rest of the week I can't figure out what day of the week it is. So, like, I thought it was Thursday pretty much all week long. And tomorrow's going to be Thursday. I'm going to wake up and go, it can't be Thursday. And uh, I'll be confused on that one, so... But I uh, hope you've gotten uh, a blessing out of the services. It's been great to be a part of that. Uh, also, if you have not yet purchased, I see a couple of those stacks are pretty low. So uh, if you were wanting to buy anything tonight, you might want to go ahead and take care of that because uh, you're going to have to fly to Pensacola to buy them from him tomorrow. So uh, it's just going to be cheaper all around to, uh, to do it here. So. All right, I do want to take uh, just a minute. We've, we've uh, just taken a few minutes out of each service during the evenings uh, to share something God has done through the revival services. They've all been an encouragement and a blessing to me, and uh, I, I like doing that because 
you get to hear that, no, somebody else is just like me, and, and they've, had to, they've, had to, they've had to make that decision too, and uh, look how God is blessing them, and uh, it's always an encouragement. So I've stalled. I've given you, time to, given you time to think. Carla's not even waiting for me to ask. She's ready to go. Go ahead, Carla. Anyone else? Steve? Dale? Yeah, amen. Amen. All right. Well, many other blessings I know and just some exciting things that people have shared with me that are uh, going on that God is doing in their life, in their families, and um, uh, it's just, I, I, this has been exactly what we needed, and uh, I'm thankful for that. And then I uh, got a phone call today from a gentleman who got our John of Romans in the mail, it called to thank us for it, he goes goes to another church, but he just said, thank you for sending that, and, uh, and asked to call him back, I just got that message this evening when I got here, so I haven't had a chance yet, but I'll try to get back with him, and uh, just talk with him for a few minutes. So, uh, you know, God is if God is at work. Sometimes it's a little harder to see it than at other times, but God is at work, and I'm grateful for that. I ask Brian to come back and lead us in our next two songs together. All right, if you'll stand with me one last time for this revival, six twenty-seven. What a day that will be! We'll sing both verses. <clears throat>
this I shall see when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. 676. 676, the banner of the cross. We'll sing the first and the last. The banner of the cross. the Lord. I hope you're still hungry spiritually. One, one more meal this week, and then uh, you have to wait till Sunday. And uh, I know y'all been chomping at the bit. Can't wait for me to get back in the pulpit, but uh, you know, we'll just wait one more night with Brother Willette, and then you can have me back. It'll be all right. <laughs> but um, uh, I have uh, just enjoyed the fellowship as much as anything, getting to talk to him and uh, just ask some questions and get some questions answered, uh, and get the benefit of many years of wisdom and uh, many years of walking with God, and it's always as much of an encouragement as the preaching is. So, brother, would you come and uh, one last time? Yes, one last you, you get one last prison. He wants a prison every night. Yeah. That's what he said. So, uh, this is a multi-tool survival knife. It is a can opener, a bottle opener, a saw, a knife, a screwdriver, a wing nut wrench, and a hexagon wrench, all in one tool, and you need not ever go to Home Depot again. <laughs> I notice you've given me a lot of knives. I don't, yes, is there, I, is there, you just like knives? I like knives, I yes. Like, I, this is my EDC, my everyday carry knife right here, so. Zero Tolerance is the name of the brand, if you know anything about knives. That's what I carry all the time, except on the airplanes. Thank you so much. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for the good meals. Uh, I uh, neglected to mention the Kofi's and Ms. Murphy last night. Wonderful meal. And this is fasting out tonight. Fabulous meal. Thank you so much. And preachers taking me to good lunches. We went Monday to Chick-fil-A. I offered to buy on Sunday. If you go to Chick-fil-A. But he, he didn't take me up on that. And uh, thank you for your kind words and your faithfulness and your, your consistent attendance. And I'm so grateful I got to be here for these days. Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26. It is uh, 97 years since Abraham has gone to the same place Isaac now goes for the same reason. Ungodly land, pagan land, but there's a famine. Where Isaac lives, there's a famine where Abraham lived. And just about a century later, Isaac finds himself in the same spot. Here's what the Bible says. Verse 15. The wells, which his father's servants, had digged in the days of Abraham's father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. Let me tell you something about Philistines. They don't dig wells, they just stop them. They don't bring water of life to anybody. They just tear up what somebody else built. Theological liberals never built a college. 
They just steal one that was built by Bible believers. Do it all the time. Why would you fill up a well? It's an arid region. They need water. Why would you stop up a well? Now, this is not the sermon. But if you're not careful, you'll do that to new Christians sometimes. They'll come in. They'll be all excited. They'll think the preacher's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And you'll say, well, you know he's a good man, but he's got his faults. Oh, really? What? Tell me. If you're not careful, you discourage people. Stop the well. And Abimelech, verse 16, said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abram his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abram. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley <coughs> and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Essek, because they strove with it. They digged another well and strove for that also, and he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence and digged another well, and for that they strove not. And they called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, for now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. I want to talk to you tonight a little bit about this thought. They can take your well, but they can't take your water. Lord, guide me, help me, empower me, direct me to say only and always what you want said. Bless the preaching, bless the invitation. Help us respond obediently as you speak and do speak to us. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice, number one, the titles. Isaac named the wells, called them by the same name that his father had called them. Now, the titles were significant. They meant something. Called the first one Essek which means contention because they fought with about it. Call the next one Sitna, which means enmity because they strove with them about that. Call the third one Rehoboth, which means plenty of room because they didn't fight and now there was room for them to dwell in the land. Significant title. Uh, used to be if we said something, it meant something. Used to be if you said you're a Baptist, you believe the Bible was the sole rule in matters of faith and practice. Now there are Baptists who deny the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Significant titles, but they were the same titles. Now, we live in a name-changing era. There's no more Tiger Stadium. I don't know what it is, the Mrs. Grace W. Ferguson Screen Door Company Stadium or something like that. Um, people change the name of their churches. I went to the Southside Baptist Church in Greenville, South Carolina when I was a boy. It was pastored by one of John Rice's sons-in-law, and no longer is it the South Side Baptist Church. <coughs> it's not even a church. It's just, <coughs> just the South Side Fellowship. Well, I am a Baptist because the Bible said that the Lord Jesus said, until John were the law and the prophets, but now the kingdom of God is preached unto you, and every man pressed into it. Jesus made a distinction between the Old and New Covenant in the person and work of John the Baptist. By the way, my Savior was baptized by John the Baptist. He wasn't baptized by John the Methodist or John the Catholic or John the Presbyterian. I pastored a church for 44 years. Oh, it's popular to say uh, First Baptist Ministries because after all, we do so much more than just have church. You know, your church may have a lot of ministries, but you'll never be anything more valuable, more important, more biblical than an old-fashioned, independent, New Testament, Bible-believing, soul-winning Baptist church. Jesus died for the church. People who uh, marry people of the same gender are, according to the Bible, sodomites. They don't mind any other name you call them. Call them gay, call them queer, call them about anything. They embrace that, but don't call them a sodomite. That's a Bible term. Uh, people who have a problem with alcohol are not alcoholics. They're drunkards. Same titles. Titles. But notice not only that, 
Notice a tendency. Isaac, you won't like this point. I don't like it a bit. Isaac had a tendency to deference. He dug a well. He did all the work. All the dirt and the mud and the stones and the debris, he dug out until the water is flowing again. And no sooner is the water there, the Philistines come by and say, hey, that's our water. And you know what he did? He let them have it. He did it again. A second time, hot, arid region, difficult, no mechanical equipment. Deep, steep, narrow well, pulling stuff out, bucket at a time. And they get to the water, and the Philistines come and say, the water is ours. He said, you can have it. Now, why did he do that? Well, Isaac was a wimp. No, as a matter of fact, we read the verse. Abimelech said to him, would you leave here because you're much mightier than we are. He had every capability of beating them in battle, but he deferred to them. I mentioned the other night, most of the stuff we fight over is silly. Silly. Deference. Giving in to the wants and wishes of others. I took a personality test when I was in college. I failed. In the test, they asked the same question twice on 10 different questions. And you checked to see if you answered it the same way. That would determine how accurate your result was. They said if you got the same answer seven or eight out of 10 times, then it was an accurate result. I got the same answer 10 times. So I'm a very accurate test. I scored very high in autonomy. Want to have your own way, do your own thing. I scored very low in deference. Not knowing my score, the teacher said, now, if you happen to score high in autonomy and low in deference, you won't be around here very long. Now, by the grace of God, that's not the way I normally live. I say to the preacher all the time, whatever you want. I want to be the easiest guy you ever have to mess with. I've had people come in and they got long lists of stuff and they got to eat this and they can't eat that and they got to eat at this time and they got to have this kind of a room and they got to have this kind of an office available for them. And I discovered as a young man the quota for big shots in the work of God was filled a long time ago. Don't need any more. And if you walk in the spirit, you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh, but it wasn't natural for me. I uh, heard Paul Harvey years ago Tell about an older lady in a busy parking lot waiting for a spot. And she waited patiently as somebody came out and put all their stuff in the car and got in the car. Have you ever waited for somebody to back out of a parking spot? What are they doing in there? It's not an airplane. You don't have 75 things to check off. This back out, you can put the seatbelt on later. And just as the car began to back out, she was going to pull her Mercedes in there. A young kid in a Corvette zipped in and grabbed her spot. She was upset. She up there and said, hey, you can't do that. That's my spot. He barely looked back. He just said, sorry, lady, that's how it is when you're young and fast. We hadn't taken about three or four more steps. And he heard, Bruh! and he turned around, and she had rammed her Mercedes into the back of his Corvette. Corvettes are typically made of fiberglass. Mercedes are made of sterner stuff. His car fared the worst in that encounter. He was mortified. His most valuable possession is pride and joy. He said, you can't, <coughs> you can't do that. That's my car. And she said as she walked into the store, or drove away, excuse me, sorry, Sonny, that's how it is when you're old and rich. <laughs> Deference. We like that story because it appeals to our flesh. But he had another tendency. He had a tendency of determination. He needed water. He was going to get water. Now, he had to dig three wells to get enough water from one well. But he was going to get it. And that's, here's what Isaac knew. Here's the heart of the message. Isaac knew that though they could take a well, the water flowed in way more than one spot. 
And the water table extended way beyond one well. And they could take any well they wanted, but he could dig another well and he was going to get some water. Let me tell you what happens in life. People steal our wells. You'll come to a meeting like this. You'll be encouraged. God will work in your heart. And you go to work the next day, and somebody will be such an absolute jerk. All of the enthusiasm and all the joy that you've been experiencing goes whoosh, Just like that. You're doing great. You get a bill in the mail you hadn't expected. Having a wonderful day, and some gripey person calls up and dumps on you for 20 or 30 minutes, and all your joy is gone. You know what revival is? Revival, at least in some measure, is when we come apart from all of the pressures and all of the problems and all of the difficulties and all of the discouragements of the world. And we realize the water of life is still available to us and we dig another well. I don't just, I don't know if I can do that. But I got a question. Let me ask you, how many of you can do this? I got a question. How many of you can do this? The water of life is still there. God is still God. The Spirit of God still indwells you if you're a child of God. The Bible is still the Word of God. Everything that God has promised is still true. You just need to dig another well. They dig your well. You can't change that. But it's up to you if you let them take your water. I went to the First Baptist Church of Bridgeport in 1975. We didn't have many people, 50 on a Sunday morning, 20 on a Sunday night, 12 on a Wednesday night. A couple old, handful of old pews on each side, old oaken pews, and uh, not much. But when you got to the fall, and we showed a film called Thief in the Night, two nights in a row. It was about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. It happened that there was a guy in Virginia who said the Lord Jesus was going to come back one of those nights we're showing that film. We packed the building out. I got on the new news I'm an NBC affiliate in Saginaw. I called all the newspapers and all the radio stations, all the TV stations, and I told them, hey, we're showing this film when this guy says the Lord may come back. Well, they thought I was saying the Lord was going to come back while we're watching the film. He thought he had a live one, and he was, you know, going to embarrass me. We packed the building out. One of the guys got saved, he and his wife, young couple, children, small children. And I talked to him. He's going to come on Sunday and get baptized. He didn't come. I called him up. And I said, man, I missed you. Oh, he said, I went back to work the next day. He said, I work with a guy who goes to First Assembly. First Assembly had a big old building. All kind of money. We didn't have anything. And he said, uh, he told me the Baptists were good at the gospel, but they weren't good at the Holy Spirit. And he told me to go. He said, I went to his church Sunday, and I got baptized, and I, got, I joined that church. Whew. Took my well. I showed the film. I gave the invitation. I went on the news and looked like an idiot. And he just stole it. We moved into town. There was a welcome wagon. Now, Saginaw used to have 100,000 people. That's the, the city of Bridgeport's right next to it. In fact, our church has a Saginaw mailing address. And uh, it's got 40-something thousand now. We don't have a welcome wagon. We just wave goodbye. But uh, the welcome wagon lady called me a couple days later. She said, I'm not supposed to do this, but another family just moved in. They're Baptist. You're new here. They're new here. I just thought you might want to go see them. She gave me the name and address of Don and D. Workman. I went by. They not only were Baptist. They were independent, fundamental, soul-winning King James Baptist. And I said, oh, man, I'm glad I got to meet you. They were just still putting the boxes off the truck and in the garage. And I said, you got to visit our church. Oh, they said, we already know what we're going to church. I said, you do? Where are you going? They named your church. I said, yeah, it's a good church. Church was pastored at that time by Jack Hyle's son-in-law. He was on the board of the Sword of the Lord. I said, how did you decide to go there? Well, we called the sword of the Lord, and they told us 
that's where we ought to go to church. I drove away. I thought, good night. I'm, I'm never going to get anything done in this town. We got a crummy building. We got a handful of people. We don't have any youth program, no any choir, we don't have anything going on. And uh, I got there first. I canceled my subscription to the Sword of the Lord and burned every book in my library by John Rice. They took my well. Happens, doesn't it? Gary Wilkins left our church to go to Bible college. Went to Standish, Maine and started a church for the first Seven years he met in a Kiwanis hall. He had an L-shaped hall. Half the people were this way, half the people were this way. Pulpit was at the corner. You could have a church split and nobody had to leave. They just switched sides. <laughs> Finally bought a piece of property. Finally got a building up, beautiful New England style building. It's about a half hour north of Portland, Maine. And he got a couple buses. He could have Sunday school. He could run buses. And it wasn't a week or so, and somebody burned both his buses. Now, if you know anything about New England, they are not particularly welcoming to new people. My dad's from Springfield, Mass., and he wasn't that way, but that's the way the culture is. You can live there 20 years, and they call you the new guy. And Gary Wilkins got a phone call from the superintendent of the public school system. And he said, we heard somebody burn your buses. We just bought a couple new buses. We got these old ones we really don't need. We'd like to give them to you, but we can't do that. Would you like to buy them for a dollar a piece? Wow. Our buses are worth a dollar a piece. And Gary Wilkins got two brand new buses compared to the other ones, new to him, better than the ones they burned. Got $1,700 from the insurance company. Hey, they took his well, but they didn't take his water. Dick Snavely is pastor of the Calvary Baptist Church in Findlay, Ohio. It was growing. People were being saved. Somebody really didn't like what was happening there. They burned his whole building down. Made it uninhabitable, unusable. They thought, yeah, we'll see what will happen now. Dick Snavely found a public school gymnasium to rent. And he put an ad in the newspaper. And he said, churches don't burn, buildings burn. Calvary Baptist Church will be meeting at such and such a high school on Sunday morning. And the church continued growing and more people got saved, and more people came went into the gymnasium than when they'd been in the building. Somebody took his well. Nobody could take his water. Has it happened to you? And we just kind of let it go, and we just kind of stay down. And the fact is, the water of life is available to us all the time. We just have to dig another well. You can be as close to God as you want to. Draw nigh to God. He will draw nigh to you. Somebody said it like this. They said, one ship drives east and another west with the self-same winds that blow. Tis the set of the sails and not the gales that decides the way we go. Like the winds of the sea or the waves of fate as we travel along through life, tis the will of the soul that decides its goal and not the calm or the strife. Golden Blount founded the Down River Baptist Temple, great church, Back in the 70s, inflation was even higher than it is now. And uh, people would build a building they really couldn't afford. And they'd sell bonds, and they'd have graduated payments. And by the time the payments got up, inflation would make it so they could pay for it. He did that. A lot of people were doing that. But before they got to that point, they had a church split. And now part of the people are left to pay the bills that all the people voted to incur. Golden Blount had to sell the building. A little handful of people found a small church building somewhere they could use. It was terrible. It was dark. Gloomy. They were just hanging on. One day, Golden Blount was sitting down by the Detroit River reading his Bible, having his devotions. And he came to the end of the book of Job. And the Bible said that Job's friends put that word in quotes. They falsely accused him all through the book. God said to them, 
in essence, I'm, these are my words, not the King James Bible words, I ain't messing with y'all. He said, if you want anything, you go tell Job, my servant Job will pray for you. And here's what it said. Golden Blount read these words. So God turned the captivity of Job when he had prayed for his friends, the friends who lied about him, the friends who mistreated him, mis, uh, uh, falsely accused him. So he made a list of all those people. He began to pray for him. It was hard. But it got easier. And after a while, he got to where he wasn't angry with them anymore, wasn't upset with them anymore, didn't have any bitterness left. He wanted God to help him, he wanted God to bless him, he wanted God to use him. And about that time, the Spirit started to improve in the church, and people started getting saved, and the work of God went forward. <coughs> and I met Golden Blount in his later years when he was a happy warrior for the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody took his well, nobody could take his water. Tom Lone founded the Emmanuel Baptist Church. He had been going to Bob Jones College in Cleveland, Tennessee, never quite finished. His wife, Joyce, was somewhat younger than him. They got engaged, and uh, she said, now, I think we ought to have at least $1,000 in the bank before we get married. It's been in the 19, probably 30s. And he said, all right. And after a little while, she said, how are you coming on that $1,000? She said, well, pretty good. I got $35.48. She said, that's close enough. He got convicted that he ought to finish school. And while pastoring Emmanuel Baptist Church in Pontiac, Michigan, he would drive every Sunday night after church to Cleveland, Tennessee on two lane roads and go to school till Friday. Friday, midday his class, then did he drive back to Pontiac, take some visits on Saturday, preach on Sunday, drive back, did that till he finished. Tom Lone founded the Midwestern Baptist College, which has Thousands of graduates serving God around the world. Some of them pastors of large churches, some in this state. Charles Keene, a graduate of Midwestern Baptist College. And he saw the church grow to 3,500 a Sunday. 1,500 driving, 2,000 on the buses. He get older, and he brought other pastors in, but he, he didn't handle it real well. And the church had already gone down some. Last pastor that came in and tried to get the church to cancel Dr. Malone's pension that they agreed to pay him. Tried to get him kicked out of his office. Tried to take the college away from him. And that church went down to 90 people. And they called Tom Malone as a man in his mid 70s to come back and be their pastor. First Sunday went back. 90 people in church, and 60 of them came on the bus. They had a big 1,200-seat auditorium, all theater seats. They said, Preacher, you want us to rope up some of these seats? He said, we're going to look at those seats until we fill them. Face them until we fill them. Here's what Tom Malone did, mid-'70s. Got up here morning, ate breakfast with his wife. Went to the office, did a little work. Went out soul winning, knocking on doors. Came home, ate lunch, took a nap. Went back to the office, did a little work. Went back soul winning. Came home, ate supper. Went back. Knocking on doors, went soul winning three times a day. And the Emmanuel Baptist Church grew to an average attendance of over 600 and a big day of over 1,000. And there was a time the fastest growing church of any kind in the state of Michigan was pastored by a 76-year-old man. They took his well. No way they took his water. Dr. Rice died. Uh, Curtis Hudson followed him at the sword of the Lord. He had cancer when he was in his early 60s, late 50s, early 60s. Hadn't been to the doctor in years. He was going to preach the Southwide Baptist Fellowship, big meeting, thousands of people always there. Last big meeting he ever preached. Preached it in October, lived till March, but last big meeting he ever preached. A friend of his, co worker, Johnny Stansel, called me up. He said, The Black Horse, that's what I called Dr. Hudson, is going to preach it Southwide. We'd like to get a real nice bus like the country singers use to take him there. 
could you help finance it? I said, sure. And then he said, would you like to ride on the bus? I said, I'd love that. I flew to Nashville. They picked me up to me to Dr. Hudson's home in Murfreesboro. I got in the bus, just one other preacher there. Dr. Hudson would say, I'm not really having any pain. I'm just a little sore. But I watched him when everybody else was asleep and he thought I was asleep. And just to cross or uncross his leg, he'd pull his lips tight against his teeth. We got to the motel. I'd run and pick up a rental car to get to my next meeting. They saved a spot for me with a family. Dr. Hudson got up to preach. He said, before I preach, I want to sing. And he sang, well, I'm on the winning side. I'm on the winning side. And then he preached. You can look it up on YouTube. Things that are different are not the same. Phenomenal message. King James Bible, not the same as other translations. Independent Baptist, not the same as Southern Baptist. Uh, evangelicalism, not the same as fundamentalism. Mm, soul winning, not the same as lifestyle evangelism. He was on. Great sermon. He got all done. He said, my precious children have been so sweet. My oldest daughter, Sherry, said, Daddy, I hate to talk like this, but we have to talk. You die. Lord takes you home. What do you want on your grave marker? He said, I told her on one side, put the plan of salvation, I'll write it for you. I've been there. Big old marker, gospel clearly etched into the stone, an invitation for a sinner to pray and ask Jesus to be a savior. He said, on the other side, put the last two stanzas of there is a fountain filled with blood. He said, I'm going to sing them for you if I can. And he sang, ere since by faith I saw the stream thy healing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. And then he sang. He began to choke up a little bit. When this poor, lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. I sat there with the family, weeping unashamedly. See that man dying of cancer. They took his well. Couldn't take his water. Lord, I don't know who needs this message. You know I was inclined to preach something else, and I believe you directed me here. So would you help us? Determined by your grace, no, many, no matter how many times they steal the well we've dug up, to not get upset, to not retaliate, to not fight back, to dig another well to realize they can take all the wells they want, but they can never keep us from the water of life. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. Simple question for the invitation. I wonder who says, Brother Willette, I need to dig another well. I've let the devil and the world and circumstances and trials and troubles take my well, but I'm not going to let them take my water. You pray with me about that. If you say that, hold your hand up high. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You lifted your hand. You meant business about it. I believe you did. Would you slip out of your seat right now? Find a place to come to the altar and talk. Lord, just come ahead. It'll be all right. Lord, bless us. Help us to act obediently. Help us to do what you've told us in our heart. Help us to begin the digging of the well as we kneel at the altar this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand, heads bowed, eyes closed. Music plays. You do what God tells you to do.
thank you so much for loving us, helping us, working in our hearts. And I pray again, it'll be a long time from now, I forgot who said it or where they heard it, you'd bring back to our hearts and minds that thought, hey, they took our well, but they cannot take our water. Help them to be so, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me thank you again for all your kindness. I've really enjoyed my time at your church. And the preacher said there's an offering, so let me thank you for that, whatever it is. I promise you it'll be more than I deserve and less than my wife would spend on the grandkids. You cannot get my wife to spend money on herself. When it comes to the grandkids, she makes Congress look fiscally conservative. <laughs> Spend money on the grandkids. What else can you spend it on? Hey? All right, let's close with a word of prayer tonight. And again, uh, if you haven't stopped by and taken a look, or if you have been thinking about it, tonight, uh, tonight's the last night to get something off the table uh, and, uh, and then stop by the offering box on the way out and drop something in for uh, Brother Willette to uh, thank him for his time and uh, for preparing those messages. Father, we, uh, we have heard from you. Uh, each service of this revival meeting, and uh, Lord, I thank you for the obedience of our heart to respond and and surrender whatever it is that you've spoken to our hearts about. And Lord, to, we just ask that you would that you would continue the work that your word has started as seed has been planted and it's been watered. Uh, Lord, the harvest takes time, so Lord, help us to be faithful and allow you to bring the harvest of these seeds that we've, uh, we've allowed to take root. Father, we pray that you would bless Brother Willette as he travels down to Pensacola and continues uh, on the road. We pray that you'd st continue to strengthen his voice and restore his health and strength. And Lord, we pray that you'd continue to use him for your honor and glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.